Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Technology and Scale in Microenterprise, Lessons Learned from Grameen America. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items, so all callers will be muted. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. If you lose connection, try refreshing your browser um, using the link that was emailed to you. Um, and then we also have a phone number that you can dial into in case you can't uh, get the audio to connect. If you have to leave the webinar early or if you would like to review the webinar again, we'll be hosting the information on our website at techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. You'll also receive an email with the presentation, the recording, and any relevant links that we talked about today. If you're on social media, feel free to tweet at us at TechSoup using hashtag TSWebinars. But like I said earlier, we'll be using the chat box that you see here on the left-hand side. So just a little bit about TechSoup. We are in 236 countries and territories, and we serve over a million nonprofits around the world. We partner with several technology organizations like Adobe, Amazon Web Services, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec, and several others that you can see here to make our mission possible. Um, they provide either donated, discounted, or free hardware and software. Um, so I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. So if you guys don't mind uh, just chatting in where you're calling in from, and I'll read out a few of them. Okay, so we have somebody calling in from Austin. Hopefully we have some more. We got NYC. Uh, we have Mesa, Arizona. Okay, so it seems like you guys can hear me okay. Um, and then if you're interested in seeing what technologies we provide for nonprofits, you can visit our tech marketplace, and you can see the URL here, techsoup.org slash get dash product donations and see which uh, technology is available to your nonprofit. All right, so we have a, uh, a full list of speakers here, and it's also International Day of the Girl, so it's really exciting that we have all of these people here who are uh, supporting girls and women around the world. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone that is on the call today. So for starters, we have uh, Colleen Galvin. So Colleen is a Senior Vice President with City Community Development's New York Tri-State Market. She leads a team of relationship managers with a portfolio of nonprofit and municipal partners across New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We have Marcus Berkowitz, and Marcus joined Grameen America in 2012 after serving as a Kiva Fellow in Ecuador, where he focused on streamlining and improving the flow of client data between Kiva and its intermediary. At Grameen, he's focused on developing and maintaining a robust technology function to support operational scale. We also have uh, Joyce Klein. So Joyce Klein is the Director of Field at the Aspen Institute, which advances business ownership as an economic opportunity strategy. And then we have our moderator today, Sandy Fernandez, who is the Director of MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, where he's responsible for developing and implementing the center's strategy and programs across the Americas. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Sandy. Great. Um, thank you so much, Seema. Um, so I'm looking forward to the conversation today with everyone on, on the line. So the webinar um, that we're all joining today comes at a really great time in Grameen's history. It's their 10th anniversary. And they've also reached a milestone of investing a billion dollars um, in businesses of more than 100,000 low-income women entrepreneurs. So it's really exciting. Um, and the organization's growth um, has been um, significant over the last couple of years. And this is due to a number of different factors, including um, strong leadership from their CEO, Andrea Jung, um, and also many folks on the call, including Marcus Berkowitz, um, who's led up the technology implementation that you'll be hearing more about, um, their culture of innovation, um, and also their ability to um, achieve financial sustainability in a number of their branches. Um, and the webinar is based on an impact report that was done by UC Berkeley, Laura Tyson, Jennifer Walski, and Elizabeth Foster. And in this conversation today, um, we're going to hear more about Grameen's continuous journey to scale via their partnership and collaboration with funders, um, also, their ability to utilize tech platforms and tools to enable digitization, enhance um, and have a fluid customer experience, and deliver and have greater capacity to deliver on their mission. We're also going to hear a little bit about how the larger microfinance and um, community development financial institution sector is, used a lot, is utilizing technology as well. So with that, I want to um, turn it over to Joyce Klein to sort of set the stage around um, microfinance and technology in the U.S. 
Great. Thank you, Sandy. And um, so glad to be here today with, with, with this webinar. So um, as you heard when you were introduced, I, I'm with the Field at the Aspen Institute, and our mission is to advance business ownership here in the U.S. as an economic opportunity strategy. And um, one of way, the ways that we do that um, is we work closely with microfinance practitioners in the U.S. Um, and, and do things as a national nonprofit that we do well, things like research and evaluation and peer learning and leadership development to help them to, to build their, um, the work that they do to advance their scale, to help them innovate, uh, and to help them deepen their impact. And so one of the things we've been looking at is this issue of how microfinance organizations in the U.S. are using technology as we've seen the explosion of, of fintech uh, in this country and, of course, globally, how that's applying um, and being used in uh, microfinance organizations in the U.S. And um, one of the things I just wanted to share is that as microfinance organizations think about how they use technology, what it re they really use it to do is to support their mission as organizations to deliver credit and sometimes other services to uh, underserved entrepreneurs, the people who have real difficulty accessing the credit and other services they need um, from uh, banks and other traditional financial institutions. Um, so they're typically trying to serve low and moderate income individuals. They have a, a business strategy for how they do that, and they have a set of processes that they use. And, and that strategy and those processes are really tailored to the kinds of clients they're, and individuals they're trying to serve and, and to try to meet their needs. And so we like to think about uh, the role that technology plays and helping to either sort of advance the scale and efficiency of their work or to address pain, process, pain points in that business process. Um, so I think that's a general picture for how technology plays in microfinance. I'm going to turn it back to Sandy um, to move us along. Great. Um, thanks, Joyce. That was really helpful. Um, so now let's turn it over to Grameen America and um, Marcus Berkowitz. So Marcus, you know, Grameen has a really unique microfinance model. Um, that was adopted and transplanted from work that's been done in Bangladesh by Mohammed Yunus. Can you share a little bit more about the model um, and also speak to how and why your organization made such a large investment to transition to, to new technologies? Sure. Thanks, Andy. I first just want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Colleen Galvin and City Community Development, who you're about to hear from, and also to thank you, Sandy, from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for, um, for the support of this project. We wouldn't be here um, if it wasn't for your support. And then also for, to, uh, to Joyce um, for joining us on this, call, this uh, webinar, as well as the TechSoup folks who are, are putting it on. Thank you to, to all of you. So, um, Sure. So uh, Grameen America is a 10-year-old micro lender in the United States. Um, we, are, we are a replica of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, um, which was started uh, about 30, 35 years ago um, in Bangladesh as a poverty alleviation tool. Um, and so you know, we, we, uh, we began about uh, 10, 10 years ago to address um, a couple of the challenges that, uh, that were you know, that are facing small um, women-owned uh, businesses. So if you take a look at this slide, you know, the, the really striking statistic here is, is this one that's in the bottom right, that women entrepreneurs account for only 4% of all conventional small business loans. This is something that we're really trying to tackle with this model. Um, and we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, so we, we do it through loans. Uh, we, we give small microloans starting at uh, a, ma a first time ceiling of about $2,000 per member. Um, we also do it through asset building with our partner banks and, and uh, Colleen, I know we'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, and we do it through credit reporting. Um, so if you go back to this, uh, this slide here, you can see that um, 30% of low income consumers have no credit history. That plus the, um, the, the unbelievable sort of lack of, of capital flowing to small women-owned entrepreneurs are really the two you know, big challenges that, that we're looking to tackle. Um, so that's, that's how it works. Um, the, the, the model itself um, has expanded across the U.S. Uh, since we first started in Jackson Heights back in 2008. Um, we're now at 20 uh, branches serving um, about 50,000 members. We've now served uh, in our history over 100,000 members um, and disbursed a billion dollars in, in plus in, uh, in loan disbursements. Um, and so the, the way that the model works specifically is, uh, you know, when we issue the loan, um, we do issue it to an individual, but there's a, a group um, uh, sort of process around it. So 
Um, we as a financial institution, when we approach a community, we face the same challenge as any other financial institution. We don't know who um, is really going to invest the money in their business, who's going to uh, have the sort of uh, ability to, to grow and invest on behalf of themselves and their families, and who's going to then be able to repay us so that we can issue new loans. Um, and so the group uh, is, is a way to do that, right? They, you know, we don't know who in a community is, is going to be able to make these investments, but the community itself does know. Um, and so the, 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 group, uh, the group incentives are a way for us to, um, to, to sort of find out who in that community is really capable and, and, uh, and ready to, to invest the money in, in a small business that's going to uh, help them and, and their families. Um, so one of the uh, uh, projects that, you know, in order to do that successfully across the United States, um, we needed to really be able to scale and, and, um, and taking a look at the, the obstacles that were in the way of, of really scaling that model across the U.S., um, you know, there were some very specific things that, uh, that we wanted to achieve in terms of making sure that each individual employee could serve as many folks and serve them well um, as we possibly could. And so what we really did uh, in order to decide to make this technology investment was we took a look at some of the specific uh, processes that were going into um, you know, our, our growth and tried to understand how we could make them more efficient. Um, the system that we had had uh, prior to this migration um, had been developed many, many years ago in the context of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. We were using um, the same system that, we ha that they had there at, at the Grameen Bank. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, in, in that context, it made a lot of sense. There, were, there was a lot of uh, paper. It was built to basically print out uh, collection sheets and take them out into the field. And that works really well in a context like Bangladesh where technology is expensive and not very accessible, um, but, but, you know, but, but it's very easy to hire folks. You know, uh, you know labor costs are much lower. Um, and then taking that model and translating it to the United States where the inverse is true, right? Uh, labor here is quite expensive, but technology is very cheap and accessible. And so we thought, well, how can we sort of adapt this model, um, which, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're meeting with every single one of these 50,000 women every single week. Um, and the whole point of our program is to be able to look these folks in the eye and, and help them through the business challenges that they're facing um, right there face to face, right? And so, you know, uh, how do you maintain a model that is very human to human, um, very much, uh, you know, look, look, look our members in the eye and, and have that conversation with them, um, you know, while facing the reality that, uh, that the context is different here in the United States. And so we looked um, at, at some specific processes. So, for example, you know, one, it, one transaction, when we used to do this, and we do 2.5 million transactions per year um, and growing, um, each one of those transactions was written in a passbook uh, and put on a coat, right, written then again a second time on a collection sheet. That sheet was brought back to the office and then entered into a computer, right? So the same transaction is being processed three times. Um, and, uh, you know, and they're, and they're doing it on pieces of paper. Um, so the experience of a, of a center meeting, of our, our weekly meetings for, for, for loan repayments and, and business discussions um, were really limited uh, because most of the time was spent sort of shuffling through papers and, and accepting cash, um, which really took up a lot of time. And so you know, under the new system, you know, they're able to, uh, with a tablet out in the field, um, it's, it's fully cloud-based. Um, and, and mobile and tablet friendly, um, they're able to actually go out into the field, enter those repayments in real time. I sitting here in, in, uh, you know, in, in, my, in, in the technology division and headquarters can actually see that payment coming in in real time. And at the moment that that payment hits the system, our member gets a receipt immediately by text. So you know, what was once a, a three-step sort of onerous paper-based process um, was really streamlined into, into a very easy, um, very transparent uh, transaction experience. And, and what that did was, you know, it really cut down on the, the, the uh, amount of time spent in the center um, doing transactional uh, items. Um, so here's some of the impacts that, that we've had uh, in, in the actual center meeting. So we were able to actually cut the amount of transactional time by 50%. We were able to reduce paper by over 95%. Um, and, and, and we were able to actually use the technology resources that we had available to us. In other words, my team, um, we were able to deploy them instead of, um, you know, instead of spending a lot of time on, on servers and some of this old technology to really developing new integrations and, and new technologies, some of which um, uh, Colleen will talk about um, as, we go, as we go forward. Um, and so, you know, to take a look at sort of the process that we went through, um, this was the, we, you know, we went through 
a center meeting and, and several other uh, operational processes that we have sort of very specifically to try and understand where were areas where we could we could cut things out, what was being done manually, um, and what resources were required um, at, you know, at each step of the process. And so what we were able to do, as you can see in this slide, is, is you know, what we want to do is take this discussion part at the very end here, um, and we want to make that the vast majority of the meeting. Re we really want to be able to have that meaningful value-added conversation about how can we improve folks' businesses, um, you know, what does a credit score mean, how do they interact with the, uh, the, the financial system, and how can we improve that. Um, so we really wanted to take that discussion piece and make that an expanded and, and really needy part of the meeting. But the problem is that we had all of these other, uh, these other elements that we really needed to get done. The proposal of new loans when folks were requesting new loans in the center meeting, the collections and attendance, which is our really critical um, piece of data. And so this, you know, we took a look and we actually saw several places in this process that we could, that we could cut things down with the use of technology. Um, and so that's how we've been able to, you know, we, we went from a, you know, 45 roughly uh, minute meeting of which maybe five to 10 minutes um, were, were, you know, really meaningful discussion, um, you know, if, if everything went well. Um, so that's, that's this high variability piece that you can see sort of on the right hand side. It was, you know, sometimes there was a lot of time for discussion if there were no loans. Sometimes there wasn't a whole lot of time for discussion. So what we wanted to do was make that meeting a little bit more consistent um, and shorten the transactional times that we could again look at look our members, um, you know, look, you know, focus on our members one on one so that we could really uh, help them with their businesses. Um, so during this process, um, we we learned a ton. Um, you know, it, it, there there were several obstacles that the paint that that uh, that are that came out in the paper that we um, sort of. Uh, had to overcome during the course of the, the migration, um, and and so you know some of the some of our, our big lessons learned from this were to expect resistance. You know, if folks have been doing uh, something the way that they have been doing it for you know in our case you know about eight years at that time, um, but actually sort of 25 years. Some of the folks who had actually come over from the Bangladeshi uh, uh, Grameen program had been doing this for more, you know, multiple decades in, in the same way. And so there will always be resistance. And, and, uh, and so, you know, it's important to expect that and plan for it um, when, uh, when um, you know, when doing these things. And remember that most of these projects, you know, they really, they're more anthropology than technology. They have a lot more to do with convincing other human beings that, that this is sort of, uh, sort of a better way to do things and, and showing them really the, the, the improvements that can be made to their process um, and the enhancements that can be made to, to their members' experience um, you know, through some of these changes. Um, the other thing is operational disruption. Um, you know, it's great to want to say, hey, listen, we can really do this um, without, you know, without disrupting operations at all. And, um, you know, we're not, you know, there's going to be no sort of downtime and, and, and none of that. But the reality is that, that those things will happen over the course of a migration. And so, you know, it isn't, it isn't um, you know, it, it's, it's less important to sort of, it, it, it's very important to try and avoid it, but it's more important to try and plan for it and say, if this happens, here's what we're, what we're going to do. Um, and so what we did to, to sort of make those things, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, palatable to the folks that we were working with was we um, we brought in sort of what we call champions, right? So we brought in uh, folks from the field who have uh, several years of of experience doing um, doing the job out in the field, um, and actually had them work in a pilot branch, um, displaying the technology and and all of the things that that it could achieve for us, and and really showing them how it opened up the center meeting to to a more meaningful discussion, um, and then really soliciting feedback from them. You know, we we were out there. You know, pretty much every day in the early days when we when we did the the uh, the pilot branch, um, just getting feedback and saying, hey, really, what doesn't work? What do you feel like you're missing from from the old system? Um, and uh, and and how can we actually develop that so that so that we can enhance this um, even further? So, um, you know, those are some of the the lessons that we learned is 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 really just expect the resistance and and plan for for some disruption and and really include um, the folks who. Uh, we'll actually be using this system in the process of developing it. None of the, I can pretty say with, with confidence that almost none of the good ideas that we um, that ended up becoming integral parts of the system and the and the migration came from my technology team. They all came from folks in the field and and uh, you know folks in the field who are actually who had used the old system and who were actually using the new one um, so that uh, so that they could really speak to the specifics of what needed to be um, what needed to be changed. Um, and so I'll zoom out a little bit uh, and just go back go back to a slide that um, 
uh, that Joyce had shown us. This is sort of the way that, um, that, that that framework looked for Grameen specifically. So she had shown, um, you know, sort of the business process to being the base and supporting the strategy, um, which then allows us to, to complete our mission. And so, you know, our, our processes were really critical. We needed to streamline them and get them down to a place where they were really as fast and efficient as possible. And what that allowed us to do from a strategic perspective was scale serve more women entrepreneurs better um, using some of these secure uh, paperless mobile and cloud native tools. Um, and that in turn, you know, we, we are trying to make a dent in the lack of capital um, flowing to low income women entrepreneurs. Um, and so that strategy directly enabled that mission uh, in that way. And so, you know, we just wanted to dive in there and show you sort of exactly the way that um, the, the Grameen uh, migration and the Grameen experience fit into, uh, into that framework. And I'll hand it back to uh, Sandy for the rest. Hey, uh, Marcus, thanks so much for, for that overview. It's really comprehensive. So uh, actually, I'm just going to take um, moderator's prerogative. Um, so you've done a lot, and I love what you said around anthropology. It's more anthropology than technology. Expect resistance um, and plan for disruption. Looking back now um, at all the work that you've done, are there any considerations that you would um, re recommend folks to think about if they're thinking about their own technology? Um, upgrade within their organization? Yeah, I guess what I, what I would say is that it, it, um, you know, it, a lot of uh, folks who I've spoken to since this um, have spent a lot of time thinking about the big picture and sort of the architecture and all of that, and that's very important. Um, but I guess what I would say is what's really going to trip you up uh, is, the, is the details. It's the specifics of those process. So I'll go back to this slide and, and, and just talk about this. This piece of what does, it, what does it really look like to make a, you know, the specific key processes more efficient um, at the field level? I'd say you know, you know, uh, if I were giving sort of advice to folks, spend more time on this. Um, because this is what um, this is what will uh, make or break, I think, the success of of the project. We certainly learned that in the early pilot days. Great, um, thank you. Um, so, so let's go back to Joyce now. Um, Joyce, um, it'd be great for you to talk a little bit about um, what are the current needs in the microfinance field in terms of technology, um, specifically around CDFIs and technology and small business funding, and what are some examples and what may be on the horizon. Sure. So um, I think, you know, Marcus did a really great job of talking about the why Grameen America has modernized its technology and done the work it's done, um, and how they did it by focusing on their, the, the pain points in their process and what that implementation was like. And I would say all of those sort of uh, factors are very similar to what we see in the, in the rest of the microfinance field in the United States. Um, but I would also say that some of the specific technologies and things that uh, micro lenders are looking to do in the U.S. are different from what Grameen is doing. And the reason they're different is because um, it, they serve different customers and uh, most microfinance organizations. And they, because they serve different customers and you build your process to, you know, to optimize it for the customer, um, they use a different process. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to introduce a, a, this slide, which gives a sense of what um, most of the, uh, the rest of the microfinance field in the U.S. Uh, is doing in terms of, of technology. And, but, but maybe before I get into that, let me just uh, a few sort of definitional things. Um, one is that in the U.S., microfinance is generally, microloans are defined as loans of $50,000 or less. Uh, made for business purposes, and most microenterprises are defined as being um, businesses with five or fewer employees, including the owner. And so just to understand how the rest of the microfinance field differs a bit um, from Grameen, which serves a, a particular and really important part of that, the microfinance market, um, we work with, a, in particular, a set of, of, uh, of large-scale microlenders um, but they're different from Grameen in, in a couple different ways. One is their average loan size is $21,000. Um, so compared to, I, I think that's about 10 times the size of the, the traditional loan um, or the average loan size that Grameen does. Um, and the reason the loans are larger is they tend to finance businesses in different industries. So I, I looked at the industry mix, industry mix for Grameen. It looks a little different for the rest of the microfinance field. Um, they tend to be slightly larger. Most of the folks that are financed, the business is, 
the, the primary source of income for that individual or they're moving to try to make it the primary source of income for that individual, they may often employ one or two or sometimes three other employees in addition to the owner of the business. Um, and they also tend to serve men as well as women, um, and uh, they work in different geographic reasons. And because the industries are different, the industries have different capital requirements. So um, what that translates to is they use a different kind of lending process than the, the group process that Grameen uses, which is really well customized and, and fits their customer base. They use a lending, the most of the microfinance field uses a lending process that looks more like sort of a traditional bank process where they go out and find customers and customers apply for a loan and uh, there's a loan underwriter, an officer who, uh, you know, collects documents and approves that loan and, and issues the loan and then they collect and service on the loan. So, um, so the, the, again, the technologies that organizations are using sort of uh, reflect that process. So just a few things that, that people are doing in the U.S. One is on this first piece of sort of customer acquisition that you can see on this chart, um, you know, more and more people are shopping for everything online. Um, and so one of the things that organizations have done is they've created websites um, that microfinance organizations that allow their customers to find them online and in many cases to apply for loans online. Um, so that's one piece that they've done. They've also started in this customer acquisition box trying to develop ways through technology that other organizations like banks or other online lenders to uh, who potential borrowers might go to for a loan. If, they've, um, if, if that lender can't make that loan, they can refer them to a microenterprise organization and send over some technology, some information, um, and try to make that sort of referral process more seamless. Um, then in the loan application, I talked about having loan, you know, sort of applying for loans online, but often there's a set of documents um, that go along with that loan that, that a lender will look at. They'll want to look at things like um, tax returns for the business or bank statements for the business that sort of verify the amount of revenue that the business is generating and what their expenses are so they can get a sense of whether the person, how much of a, of a loan someone can afford to, re, a business can afford to repay. And so they're creating systems where um, folks can easily upload those documents where they used to maybe have to go into an office to sort of share those paper versions of those documents. That's another piece. Um, organizations are also using sort of more automated ways um, where they collect some information on the business and they can sort of do a pre-screen to give uh, borrowers a, a sense pretty quickly about um, whether they'll get approved for a loan and how much of a loan they might get. Um, and they can deliver that response pretty quickly, which is really attractive to a business owner who doesn't want to spend a ton of time trying to apply for a loan and, and not get an answer. Um, and often has a cash flow issue that they're trying to deal with, so maybe they can't wait a long time to get money. So it allows them to sort of do that screening. And then what they do through technology is maybe collect, uh, connect themselves to a, um, a data source or a data provider that can sort of verify some of the information um, about who they are, do things like fraud detection that you need to do in a lending process in some cases. Um, so that's another piece that gets into sort of the underwriting and loan, approving, uh, loan approval process. Um, then they're doing things like uh, technology is allowing them to generate loan documents really quickly and in some cases have people sign those documents and close the loan electronically. Um, so that again, someone doesn't have to walk into an office and sign a bunch of papers. And if you're a busy business owner, sometimes it's hard to find time to do that and you're running your business and you don't want to spend a lot of time sort of traveling someplace to do that process. Um, and then on the servicing and collections end, they're doing things like sort of doing ACH payments that again allow people to sort of uh, pay, pay that way. Um, and they're also doing things like experimented with things like using text messaging to remind their borrowers that a payment's going to be due in a couple of days and you might want to check your balance to make sure you have enough money in it and if there's a problem, um, let us know and we can think about whether we can change your payment date or something like that. Um, so all those are the ways that sort of organizations are sort of integrating technology throughout the lending process and there's lots of different options. And in a lot of ways, what we're seeing organizations do um, and try to do what we're suggesting they do is really be thoughtful about as they're trying to think about whatever part of their process they're trying to make better or um, either for their own efficiency and scale or for their customers in terms of what their customers want, think about which elements of technology really support um, the improvement in the process or the, or the pain point that they're seeing. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sandy. Great. Um, thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so Joyce, just a point um, on the latter um, comments that you made. 
Um, if an organization is thinking about um, their, their technology and how to um, implement technology within their organization, how should, what are some things that they should prioritize first um, around the items that you mentioned? Again, I think, it, I think it really varies from organization to organization in terms of, you know, what's their goal as an organization? Where do they think, what do they think they need to do better in order to achieve their mission? Um, and how does technology solve that? So um, we've been really working with organizations and sort of cautioning them, really focus first on process and make sure you're clear about what your process is and what part of it needs to be fixed before you think about technology. Because th there is so much out there right now, um, and technology is expensive. And as Marcus said, there's a whole people side of the technology process that you also need to get right. Um, so it's important to be really thoughtful and strategic about where you start, um, and it really depends on on who your customers need, you know, what your customers need, and what you need as an organization to execute better. Great, um, thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so I just want to remind folks: um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and um, type them into the Q and A box on the left hand side of your screen. Um, and we'll be taking those questions. We'll answer some of those in the box, but we'll also be um, answering some of those at the end of the webinar. Um, so now let's turn over to um, the funders, um, and in particular, um, Colin Galvin at City. Um, and City has been a significant innovator in the community development space, um, and they've had um, a long history with Grameen America and a vision with them that's being implemented via the, their technology transition. So Colleen, can you tell us more? about your investment and partnership with Grameen and how you're able to deepen that partnership by piloting loans and supporting the technology implementation? Sure. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. I, I first wanted to just quickly thank the organizers for inviting me to join you today. I also really want to commend uh, Grameen and MasterCard for having the foresight and putting in the tremendous time and effort to document and memorialize what's been accomplished here so that others can, can learn from it and, and the entire ecosystem of microfinance um, can scale. So thank you for that. I encourage everyone to read the full report. Um, so City has a long history, as Sandy said, of supporting uh, microfinance uh, both in the States and uh, overseas. I've had the privilege of working directly with Grameen America for the last five years, but our relationship really goes back about 10 years. Um, our global director, Robert Inibale, was working with Grameen in Bangladesh and was instrumental and very proud of the fact that he worked um, hand in hand with Professor Yunus and his team to open up the first branch. A lot of people said that microfinance couldn't succeed the way um, it had in Bangladesh uh, and overseas as, you know, in the U.S. with a different infrastructure. And um, it's really been proven out by the way they've scaled that first Jackson Heights branch, which was strategically located near a Citibank branch for the purpose of providing savings accounts to the members, um, is still very successful. It was um, broke even in about four years. And that model has been rep replicated numerous times, both here in New York and in other markets in the States, as you saw earlier. I wanted to um, quickly explain a little bit about our infrastructure. So I work on the City Community Development Team that primarily supports our partners through charitable contributions. And we really want to be very strategic in where we can help organizations like Grameen America to scale their mission. Um, I have colleagues in a group called City Inclusive Finance that bridges the relationship when there is a, a product or a, a bank process opportunity that could help serve their members and their organization. So while City Community Development had been providing general operating support to replicate the branch model both here in New York and then subsequently on the West Coast, City Inclusive Finance was working with the mechanics of the bank operations here to make sure that the Grameen America borrowers and members were having a good experience to open and manage their no-cost savings accounts. Um, and I, I think it's really commendable that um, Grameen has been able to take the model that we ironed out here in, starting in Jackson Heights, Queens with other banks that have been able to do the same. Um, we are a global institution, but as far as our branch footprint in the United States, it's, it's really surprisingly small relative to some other banks. And so I'm, we're so pleased that 
Grameen's had success with many other partners. Um, other ways that we've been able to support Grameen in terms of charitable support, we um, early on focused on a, a training center here. We heard from Marcus earlier about how important it is to keep the staff up to date, and they have a, a fairly large organization as you can imagine. Um, we have been very excited about um, recent efforts to replicate and ad adapt the model to serve African American women in the States. Um, and then this technology opportunity was just phenomenal. It's so aligned with how we've been supporting them over their history. Certainly MasterCard and Citi have been longtime business partners but the opportunity to partner with Sandy and his team on this large-scale technology implementation, both you know, front end in the field all the way to the back end to help them scale. Um, we were so inspired by Andrea Jung's vision. Um, she came on uh, not long after I started working with Grameen, and her vision for scale really depended on making the organization cashless, paperless. And to do that, the system that's been implemented is critical. So other ways we've been able to support these efforts, again in partnership with MasterCard, the, um, the, the loans are now dispersed on what had been like a prepaid debit MasterCard. That was originally a division of our bank that ultimately spun off into its own company while we were working out the details. I think certainly some of the challenges are always around vendor negotiation as well as training, training, training. Um, thinking about getting this information out to um, tens of thousands of members in um, New York City alone is, is, is no small task to change behavior both among the staff and the members. Um, we're also very excited about a relatively new remote check processing system that's helped Gourmet into Streamline. And really it's about the mission of helping these women obtain a financial identity. So the combination of the, the, the credit reporting that Grameen is doing and the establishment of asset building and engaging with a Main Street um, financial institution on savings is just a phenomenal combination. So I, I feel very lucky to be engaged with the organization. And um, I'll hand it back to Sandy to round us out. Great. Um, thanks so much, Colleen. Um, so I'm going to speak now to um, MasterCard's role um, in our partnership, um, both with Grameen and also with Citi in supporting the scaling of the work um, that Grameen has done to digitize um, their, their micro um, finance effort. Um, first, I'd love to also thank Grameen America for the vision of scale in the U.S. Um, we really hope that the impact report that was published really serves as an example to others um, to reach scale um, by investing in tech and people and cultivating partnerships as well. I also want to talk, um, thank Colleen um, and Bobby Nibwe and your colleagues in the city for your vision, innovation, and partnership as well. Um, so at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, um, our mission is to advance sustainable and equitable economic growth and financial inclusion around the world. And we do this in a number of different ways um, by activating the different assets that we have. Um, around research, our data philanthropy, our programmatic efforts, and also our engagement um, as well. Um, and we are the philanthropic vehicle for, for MasterCard. And in this particular partnership, when we were approached by Citi, um, who reached out to us to engage and partner with them on delivering um, a prepaid card vehicle to distribute the loans digitally, we really saw it as a compelling opportunity to test this idea on digitization of uh, U.S. community development financial institutions. Um, here in the U.S. around lending for scale, lending um, in the microfinance sector, um, which they've done to great effect, as you've heard from Marcus's um, reports on impact. Um, also, it was a really uh, fantastic opportunity to test uh, private partnerships, private-private partnerships among funders to support um, social impact and leverage our various assets. Um, so the genesis of this report um, in this webinar, like I mentioned earlier, was really leveraged through a partnership that we have with UC Berkeley. And they conducted the study um, to share with the field. Um, also, um, we were able to leverage our expertise and that of our employees um, to help deliver um, the card solution um, and also advise Grameen America as they were implementing around distribution and payments as well. And um, this has been a long-term uh, um, engagement with Grameen as well. And we continue committed to them. So this has been a multi-year effort. As you heard, City, it's been 10 years effort 
We've been with Grameen for over three years now and counting, and we continue to support their work not only in the test markets in New York and California, but also expanding the digitization and the role of the cards across the country, across all their different locations. Um, in addition to that, we've also been able to dedicate a number of different data scientists as well um, who actually developed an algorithm that helps to reduce the amount of time case managers spend on the road and increase the amount of time that they spend with clients. Um, and I think what's most compelling about all of this is the ability of all the parties involved, including City, Apple, who we had mentioned earlier, provided hardware for this, um, MasterCard and Grameen, to leverage our assets to provide real change to low-income women entrepreneurs and the power of collaboration and technology to drive scalability of CDFIs um, and expand nonprofit financial services to those in, in greatest need. So with there, I will stop. Um, we're going to turn it over um, and start taking questions from the audience. So again, I want to remind you to just type a couple of questions into the box if you have any, and we'll be able to answer them on this call. So we'll just take a moment for people to populate. So we have a question from Heather Cobb. Um, she wants to know how the 109,000 American jobs number was calculated. So I'll turn that over to the folks at Grameen. Sure. So um, that is inclusive of the business owners, um, as Joyce, I think, mentioned on her, um, you know, during her presentation. Um, and then we actually asked the question. So you know, our, our uh, loans are relatively short. They're about six months uh, each. And so we have an opportunity every six months to ask uh, survey questions around um, their business growth and, and how their businesses are doing. And one of those questions is around uh, employment. So, that, so that's how that's calculated. Great. And does Grameen America, this again is for you, Marcus, and your colleagues, does Grameen America provide the women with business training classes before dispersing loans? Yes, absolutely. So if I can go back quickly to this slide. Um, so it's, it's stuck in here. If you see this training piece, uh, the, uh, the light blue lending process row, um, that's, the, that's the piece that's really critical there. So um, before a member gets their loan, uh, they spend um, a few hours, so it's actually one hour every day for the, for the five days preceding uh, their loan and, and their induction into the program. Um, they actually receive several hours of you know, the training for, um, it, you know, it's mostly, you know, what, what am I sort of getting myself into with, with, a, with a Grameen loan, right? What are, what are the weekly meetings about? Um, what's the purpose of the group? All of those sorts of things, but also a larger training around credit scores and what they are and mean, um, you know, general sort of business training and, and the way that sort of uh, loans work and, and the financial system works in general. Um, so so it, it covers both the specifics of Grameen and some of the larger questions around uh, credit scores and, and other sort of uh, personal and business finance related. Uh, Great. Um, and can you also share again, Marcus, what are the sizes of the loans? Sure. So the biggest first-time loan is $2,000. So that means anywhere from you know, $500 at the low end to $2,000 the first time around. And the way that it works is that you know, as, as folks uh, progress through the program and they're showing, showing up at the meetings every week, um, you know, if they prove a record of attendance, um, you know, we don't, we don't ask for any collateral, we don't ask for a guarantor, no business plan, um, you know, not, no traditional sort of underwriting. And so you know, the, their attendance at the meeting is sort of a, a demonstration of their ongoing commitment to Grameen and to their own business. Um, and so that, you know, that's really the, the key, the key uh, metric that we, we use. And so as they prove that they, are, that they are attending at the meeting, they're eligible for larger loans. Um, going forward, uh, those step up in increments of between 500 and 1,000. The biggest loan we've issued, I want to say, is around $15,000 um, total. So between 2,000 roughly on the, the first-time loan, um, and about 15,000 is is sort of our, our sweet spot range. Great. Um, the next question is for Joyce um, Klein at Aspen. So Joyce, um, the question is, um, if you can speak to what are other CDFI is doing in terms of technology development and evolution, and are there any trends that you've observed? Yeah, so what I would say is one of the things that's really driving the interest in technology and the, in the microfinance field in the U.S. is the fact that you know, with the um, advent of financial technology more broadly, there have been a number of new lenders who are non-bike lenders um, who have entered the business lending market in the U.S. And 
Um, and some of those offer products that are, are good and fine products, and some of them actually offer products that can be very problematic for some business owners. Sometimes it's not very transparent what their pricing is, and their, their cost is, in fact, quite high. Um, sometimes they have other features of their products which can be very problematic for small business owners. But they're also attractive because it's very easy to, um, to apply online and you get approved really quickly. It's, they have very customer-friendly websites. They often spend a lot of money sort of marketing or using brokers to get their products in front of um, small business owners. And so what a lot of microfinance organizations are realizing is that they offer better products um, but they have to be able to sort of in some ways compete against, um, against some of these other players that are using technology so that they can also offer a good customer experience. Um, and so that's why they're thinking about ways that they can use technology to be able to do that. And so that gets into some of the things I'm talking about, whether it's having a website that allows people to apply online or easily you know, upload information or let people know fairly quickly, give them at least an initial sense of whether they'll be approved for a loan and how much of a loan they might be approved for and, and what the pricing might be on that loan um, is, are all things that, that uh, lenders are trying, microfinance lenders and other small business lenders, CDFIs that also do larger small business loans are really thinking about doing. Great. Thanks, Joyce. And um, another question for Grameen. Um, how did you choose the type of technology to employ? There's so many off-the-shelf options available today. Did you utilize a tech consultant? Um, great question. So no, we, we didn't actually use a technology consultant. The, uh, you know, we looked at several options. So we just sort of explored the field and, and narrowed it down to about four options that, that, that seemed right and really dove uh, deep on those. Um, spoke to a lot of folks in the field. Um, we basically did our own sort of technology consulting project internally to, to help uh, determine what, what the right thing was for us. And the reason we did that is actually something that Joyce spoke to earlier in her uh, presentation about how sort of the segment that Grameen is targeting is, is a little bit different than sort of your traditional micro lender in the U.S. that's giving out larger loans and individual loans. Um, and so our concern sort of was that, the, that the, the technology consultants might be drawing too much on some of those traditional lending practices that, um, that we, we, are, we sort of exist to do it a little bit differently. And so we really felt like we needed to sort of take it into our own hands using our own um, sort of our own very specific process. Um, and so we, and we, so we you know, sort of used that, that, um, that philosophy to, uh, to come up with our own set of criteria that we felt like we really needed to, um, to, to select our provider. So I know that's not that helpful to some of the folks out there looking for, um, looking for software like this. There really are a lot of good uh, sort of technology consultants out there, but we did not uh, choose to do it that way. Great. Um, and I have two more questions for you. Does Grameen help um, the women entrepreneurs set up a business plan, do market research, et cetera? No, so our, our sort of approach is, is it sort of goes a little bit something like this. The, 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 our members are running very, very small businesses. Uh, you know, um, we're, we're talking, uh, you know, a lot of sort of street vendors and mobile businesses. You know, many of them do have storefronts, and, and they develop, uh, you know, sort of uh, their, their businesses develop towards storefronts as they, as they progress through the program. Um, but, you know, the, the, the general, our general sense is that our, our members typically know their own business sort of better than we do. Um, they know what they're capable of. They know what they're doing. They're not, they're not really lacking in the skills to do their business or create it or grow it or market it. What they're really lacking in for, that from what we've seen is really just the capital to, to grow. And so you know, we, we are thinking about for some of our larger loans as folks really do progress through the, pro the program and graduate to larger loans, we're thinking about how we can um, set folks up to really, um, to really grow even further into sort of the middle um, and upper end of the small business business range, um, but for the folks who, who we're really targeting who are just starting out, you know, what they really need is, is capital and a way to save um, and a way to build credit um, more than they need sort of like advice and, and consulting. Great. Um, and final question, what's the interest rate that Grameen charges on, loan, on loans? 18%. Uh, yeah, Great. so on a, just to give um, you a sense of what that, what that looks like in practice, mm -hmm. um, on a, on a $2,000 loan, um, each weekly payment is about eighty-four dollars, um, of which a little under four dollars, on average, is um, you know is uh, is interest. So they'll pay they'll pay a little over eighty total in interest over six months on a uh, on a two thousand dollar loan. 
great. Um, thanks so much, Marcus. So we're going to wrap um, the webinar. Um, I just want to thank uh, TechSoup, Grameen, and City, and also my colleagues uh, here at MasterCard who helped us work on this webinar as well. Um, and I'm turning it back over to Seema at TechSoup to close us out. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. Um, thank you to our presenters for taking the time and, and sharing their story with us. Um, it would be great if you could chat one thing that you learned in today's webinar in the Q&A box. It's always nice for, for the uh, presenters and for us to hear feedback. We also have a post-event survey, so if you have a couple extra minutes, um, please give us your feedback on today's survey and then also any um, feedback on future content that you'd like to see. If you're on social media, please give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We post tons of new content, how-tos, tips and tricks, and that sort of thing. And then we also have a blog, blog.techsoup.org. So again, we post a lot of uh, fresh content there that, that will hopefully help your nonprofit. Um, and then if you're interested in our upcoming webinars, we have several of them coming up over the next month. So here's a date of uh, all of the webinars coming up. And then you can also see the URL where um, you can register for them. And then lastly, again, we have several donations that are available to nonprofits. If you would like to check out and see what is available to your nonprofit, please visit the URL that you see in the chat box. And then lastly, I would like to thank our presenters again. Um, I'd like to thank Zareen for helping on the back end, and then also to ReadyTalk, who is our webinar sponsor, and we hope to see you guys soon. <laughs>